Welcome to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. I'm your host, Maria Marlowe, and this is a place where we don't rely on good luck or good genes for our health and happiness, but rather we create it with our thoughts and our actions each and every single day. Each week, I'll bring you a thought or a guest that will help you live your happiest and healthiest life. Are you ready? Welcome back to the Happier and Healthier Podcast. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Dr. Kira Barr. It's very, very hard to find an MD who has more of a holistic mindset, particularly a dermatologist. So I was super psyched when I met her and I heard her speak because I knew I had to get her on the show. She is an accomplished double board certified dermatologist author, and mind-body medicine expert who's blending science with soul. She has a very unique perspective on skin health, hormonal health, women's health, and I think you're really going to enjoy her insights today. So she has been a researcher on skin cancer and melanoma. So we'll talk a little bit about that and the importance of skin or sun protection. And it's not what you think. There's definitely something she is going to share in there that you're going to be like, wow, no one's ever told me that or I never even thought that that was connected. So definitely keep your ears tuned for that. We'll also talk about why it's so important to be a body detective, as I always talk about on the show, and listen to what she calls our body's whispers and how they can give us clues and insights into where we might need some dietary and lifestyle changes. We're also going to talk about hormonal skin conditions, how we might know what are some of the signs of hormonal skin conditions, and menopause, because she, while she was originally focusing on skin cancer and melanoma and research in that area, she's shifted her focus to women's hormonal health, particularly around menopause. And she'll explain why in the episode. So we touch on a little bit of everything. And I think if you're looking for glowing skin from within, this is definitely an episode you don't want to miss. This episode is brought to you by Biosil, a beauty collagen clinically proven to reduce fine lines and wrinkles and strengthen brittle hair and nails. Unlike most collagen supplements you see on the market, Biosil is not animal-derived collagen. It's a vegan supplement containing the patented CHOSA complex. This naturally derived complex has been clinically proven to generate and protect your body's own collagen. This two-in-one effect helps ensure plump-looking skin all year long. I learned about Biosil four years ago from a friend who had glowing skin, gorgeous, long, shiny hair, and long and strong nails. I asked her secret, she said Biosil, and I've been hooked ever since. Get 20% off your first bottle on BiosilUSA.com with the promo code MARIA20 and get ready to glow from the inside out. Dr. Barr, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So first of all, I love your whole philosophy and it's so refreshing to see an MD and a dermatologist take this more holistic mind-body medicine approach to our skin and to our health. So I'm curious, I know this wasn't necessarily always the case and you have a little backstory with how you found this path. So can you share with us what, prompted you to explore a more holistic way of looking at skin and our health? Yeah. So I think this is probably true for a lot of people. Like when your own health takes a nosedive, you start looking at things very differently. And so for me, you know, being a skin cancer and melanoma specialist, when I was practicing dermatology, it was really eye-opening when I had to diagnose myself with melanoma. So starting in my childhood, you know, I was made fun of for two birthmarks that were on my skin. And I learned at a very young age that my skin could be a source of shame and anxiety. And I learned really quickly that if I got a tan, I could mask those marks. No one could see them. Unfortunately, I didn't know then. What I know now is that getting lots of tans and sunburns over the course of a lifetime yields a lot of sun damage, which ultimately, in my case, wound up with a diagnosis of melanoma. And 
up until that point, I thought I was doing everything right. Like I was exercising. In fact, I was running ultra marathons. I was going to do, I was going to be the best at everything, right? I was going to, you know, run the furthest race, juggle my academic career and my family and all the things. And that diagnosis showed me that what I was doing was not serving me at all. And that's kind of the tip of the iceberg because then I started to have gut issues and hormonal issues and all the things and going to my traditionally trained colleagues who just wanted to offer me prescriptions and things that just weren't working really led me to functional medicine, integrative medicine, and really taking a step back and exploring a whole new world. All the things that I had been told didn't make a difference in health, like diet and other things. I realized, wow, it really does. And so it really reframed how I look at skin health, how I look at overall health and well-being. And really connecting the dots, especially in my own situation, the impact that stress has, physical stress, emotional stress, mental stress on our overall health and well-being and skin cancer in particular. So that's kind of, you know, when your mess becomes your mission, I thought, okay, I'm a, I'm a physician. Uh, I've been at this for over 20 years. And if I don't have a clue how my body's working and how my body's responding, how is the average woman supposed to understand all this stuff? So again, I just wanted to pay it forward and um, share what I've learned. I can't even imagine the feeling of, of like, I'm guessing you saw your mole and maybe you saw that something had changed, right? How was that experience? I mean, that must've been so, I don't even know how to explain it. Yeah. Yeah. It was um, awful, (laughs) but so here's the thing over the course of a decade, I was having my moles, you know, uh, we, I always tell everyone to get naked, party in your birthday suit, check your suit every single month on the date of your birthday for any uninvited guests. So really getting in the habit of checking your skin for anything growing, changing, itching, breathing. So I was in that habit. So thankfully I kind of, I obviously I'm a, you know, skin cancer expert. So like I knew what to look for, but, um, I was constantly checking my skin and over the course of a decade leading up to my diagnosis, I was having, my moles were changing and I was having biopsies every couple of months. But at that time, I was just like, well, that's just what we do in dermatology. You you know, something's changing, you cut it out and you don't necessarily think about the underlying pathophysiology, the root cause of why these things are happening. And so I was doing my routine skin check and I saw the spot on my arm and I was like, wait a second, that's different. And at the time, not only was, you know, I'm clinical dermatology, my subspecialty is dermatopathology. So then I had to see what my skin looked like underneath the microscope and confirm the fact that what I was seeing on the surface was in fact really atypical underneath the surface. And it was horrifying. It was horrifying. And and I felt like crappy because (laughs) that's to say the least, like practicing what I'm preaching, right? Here I am telling people to do all these things. And then I have basically faced the very diagnosis that I'm treating, thankfully, because I was diligent about checking my skin, I was able to catch it early. But just understanding that everything that I thought was right up until that point, and understanding that I was so, so wrong. It was like, rocked my world a bit. (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine. So let's dive into that. So Obviously, we all kind of know what what we're told to to do to protect ourselves from the sun, like stay out of the sun, wear a sunscreen, wear a hat, you know, those kinds of things. So what were the things that rocked your world? What were the things where you're like, oh, this is not really working? And oh, like this, I can't believe we're not talking about this because this is this is a real issue. Yeah, so many things. Oh my gosh. And I actually Everything up until that point that I learned, I, it's, why, it's the reason why I wrote my book, The Skin Whisper, right? So our skin and body are sending us messages all the time. And mine was shouting at me and I was completely deaf to it. So the goal is to hear these messages, to see these messages that your body's sending you when they're just a whisper. So what aren't we talking about? We aren't talking about that how we nourish ourselves on every single level food, our relationships, like our careers, you know, our sleep, our movement, all of that matters and how your body deals with stress. And so when we talk about skin cancer, we talk about something called like the exposome, right? It's the environment in which your body is exposed to and, 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 and it's your total environment. So we're talking about external stresses like UV radiation and air pollution. We're talking about 
the food you eat, we're talking about your sleep and your exercise, we're talking about the emotional stress, all of that plays a role in how your immune system functions, how it responds to stress, how it repairs itself or doesn't have the ability to repair itself. So these are all the things that I discovered. And so it basically had an overall haul, pretty much every facet of my life. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, we've we've all had that moment. I think we've all been there. I think the impetus to to get there is different for each of us, but mm-hmm. we all get there at some point. So what you're saying for people like myself who definitely had a lot of sunburns as a kid, also trying to get the tan, having fair skin, trying to get the tan, and then I can remember actually wearing sunscreen and getting terrible, terrible burns, like blistering burns, uh, you know, as a kid. So uh, luckily, you know, as I got older, I stopped, you know, got out of the sun. But so for those of us who've had that experience and have been sunburned in the past, what would you say are the top two or three things that we should make sure that we're doing to to prevent anything from happening down the line? Yeah. So here's the thing. All is not lost. You know, skin cancer is the most prevalent cancer worldwide. It's also the most preventable. The problem is it's the most ignored. So what can we do, right? You mentioned some of the top things from the outside in, you know, sun protection, sun protection, sun protection every single day, rain or shine, because 80% of UV rays gets through the clouds. So it doesn't matter what season it is. It doesn't matter the weather outside, you're still getting exposure. And 90% of visible signs of aging are from UV exposure. So if I can appeal to your vanity, if you want to stay youthful and have that glowing appearance, you want to protect yourself from the sun on a daily basis. So from the outside in, wearing a broad brim hat, sunglasses, sunscreen, SPF 30 or above. And I am a big fan of the mineral-based sunscreen, zinc oxide or titanium dioxide, because they're tolerated by most people. They have been recognized as generally safe and effective. You know, there's big controversy over ingredients. It's a whole nother conversation. So, and then clothing. So the Skin Cancer Foundation will, they, and, and I believe this as well, that Clothing is your number one line of defense because then you don't have to put any chemicals on your body. You can just shield your, yourself from the sun. But you really have to build your resilience from the inside out first. And so when the things that I find that move the needle the most for people, and this is not just for skin cancer, but overall health and well-being, is really focusing on your sleep and your stress. So we need to sleep, but how can we make it better quality sleep? Because especially for your skin, it's when your skin rejuvenates, repairs, rebalances hydration. And it's also when your hormone melatonin is generated, right? So melatonin is one of the most potent antioxidants that your body naturally produces. For skin cancer specifically, or skin damage specifically, melatonin is incredibly important for DNA repair. In fact, melatonin is so incredibly important important to skin rejuvenation and repair that they are using melatonin as adjuvant therapy for skin cancer treatment. And your body naturally produces that every single night. So really optimizing your sleep is important. And the other thing is stress. Like we all have stress. We're still living in a pandemic, even though in some parts of the world, especially in the States, like we are emerging out of it, but you know, friends in Canada, they're in full lockdown, right? So that, so we're constantly under this uncertainty. We can't get rid of stress. And it's not that the problem is that stress exists. It's our response to it. So learning how to have tools in your toolkit to help modulate that stress response so it can work for you rather than against you because chronic stress suppresses your immune system. And when your immune system is suppressed, that is when chronic issues disease happens, including skin cancer. So, yeah. And I think that we all love to focus on the diet and focus on the exercise because in a way, not that they're super easy to change, but in a way it seems more attainable to change those things or easier because the stress, first of all, I think now people with the, with the pandemic, people acknowledge that they're stressed, but living in New York for so many years, nobody thinks they're stressed. Like, you know, or or people think they're handling the stress or their stress is not that bad. Like they think they're at like a five when they're like literally at a 15 on a scale of one to 10, you know? So 
Um, I'm glad that people are being more mindful about stress and really looking for ways to mitigate that. And of course, there are so many different modalities and tools in the toolkit that you could have. I'm curious if you have any favorites, like what has really worked for you? Yeah, I was just laughing because I'm a new, I, I was born and raised in New York and my parents still live there. And when I go, I feel like my energy just shifts. Like I live on the West coast now and I definitely, I live on an Island. I'm not saying I'm not stressed, but like when I go to New York, it is, it's like from five to like a hundred. I'm yeah. So yeah, I think just baseline living in a big city, it's challenging. You don't even, it, you may not be as aware how much things are impacting you. Mm-hmm. And how your nervous system is kind of already at a high state of, you know, alarm. Yeah, you're, you're like always on, on fight and flight mode. You know, uh-huh. you're just like, I, you know, when you get off the plane, and I love going to LA. I feel like when I go to LA or the West coast, it's like a breath of fresh air. It just like, it feels calmer. And then the second you land in New York, it's, it's frenetic. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that's why we love, that's why people love the city. Cause there is that energy, but I think it's just being mindful of how that energy affects you. And when you ask me, what if I found to be the most effective and, and I'm not discounting also nutrition and exercise because movement and nutrition are incredibly important, right? It's, when it comes to movement, again, we can do too much. So moving in a way that feels good for your body. For me, I was running ultra marathons that didn't serve me. There are other people where their body can handle it. It's knowing what's in, what your body can handle, how you feel, because over-exercising can suppress the immune system as well. We know that endurance athletes spending time outside increase your UV exposure again, you know, putting you at risk. So just understanding what your body needs and balancing your, your risk for benefit benefit in that ratio. So if you're an endurance athlete, then getting out earlier in the day or later in the evening is going to be important to minimize how much intensity of UV exposure you're getting. And when it comes to nutrition, there's amazing studies. And I have a lot of this in my book as well. Certain spices that have been shown to have uh, anti-carcinogenic photoprotective, sun protective benefits, tomato, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of foods that, that can be, it is food is medicine, but there is no one thing. So we, we like to put all, it's a holistic approach to our health, a holistic approach to skin care. But I do think that sleep and stress are at the top simply because as you noted, most of us put that on the back burner. We're like, we'll get to it later. We'll get to it later. The problem is we never get to it. And upwards of 80% of all doctor's visits are for stress-related ailments. Skin issues are no exception. In fact, the number one reason why people go to the doctor is for skin issues. So stress and skin, hugely connected. Our skin actually has the same mechanism. Like we always talk about the stress response, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, the sympathetic adrenal medullary axis. Your skin actually has the exact same axes in it and can reduce the stress hormones within it. So not only is it a perceiver of the stress response from your brain sending a signal to your adrenals to pump out those stress hormones and the inflammatory cascade that that follows suit, your skin can produce the exact same hormones. So it receives, it perceives, and produces. So your skin is, you know, it's, it's an incredible organ, but it's also incredibly impacted by the effects of stress. So to your question, what have I found helpful? I think number one is awareness, is really being able to tune into your body. Most of us are disconnected. It's our our mind is disconnected from our body. We're go, 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 do, do, do. And it's just taking a pause for a minute to be like, all right, how do I feel right now? Like, is this the energy that I want to feel? What do I need? What would feel like love right now for my body, right? So awareness is number one. The second biggest thing is literally breathing, especially for busy New Yorkers, busy physicians, busy people. You don't need one more thing to put on your to-do list, but we're all breathing. We do it automatically. So it's a matter of, again, awareness, paying attention to how we are breathing. Are we breathing rapid? You know, are we breathing shallow? Are we breathing in our chest or our belly? And really just tuning into that because when we can take kind of a, we we can take a pause and slow things down and take a deeper breath, 
we can go from that fight or flight mode and activate that rest and digest mode. We can turn on that parasympathetic response and literally help our body relax and you know bring the inflammatory milieu in our body down. I'm so glad you mentioned both of those things because they're things that I've been talking about for a while. And I also agree are so, so important. I always tell people you need to be a body detective because we are, we're so cut off. And I think it's not even that we're just cut off from the symptoms it's, it's we don't realize that the symptoms are, are connected in some way. So when people are breaking out with eczema and, and psoriasis and acne and this and that, and the other thing they're is a a general notion that it's just happening just because it's bad luck, right? We're not thinking, oh, it's because I'm super stressed or, oh, it's because I'm eating something I have a sensitivity to, or, you know, there's, there's also this disconnection between what we eat and what we do and how our body reacts. So I think, yeah, just taking time to slow down. And like, like you said, uh, I love the title of your book, Body Whisperer, because I, I do believe every little thing that happens is not happening just because it's happening because of some underlying root issue. A hundred percent. And that's what I help women do is it's connecting those dots, right? So because of my lens through skin, even though I'm not actively practicing dermatology right now, I really have shifted the focus of my work to help people connect the dots for themselves to help manage the stress. What I'm finding, you know, I was spending a lot of my time supporting women in menopause with bioidentical hormones. You know, they come to me thinking that they want their skin to look better, but really they want to feel better. And so I had really spent a lot of time studying bioidentical hormones and such. And it all, every single conversation kept coming back to, I'm not sleeping and I'm stressed out. We'd look at their hormone levels, they're fine. I couldn't give them any more. And so what I found is when I could teach them how to breathe and meditate or do some other mind body practices, all of a sudden they were sleeping through the night. All of a sudden they felt more at ease and more comfortable and everything else fell into place. So I think that, you know, everything is connected and even eating like nutrition is so powerful and important. And it's so interesting that fasting, I mean, there's literature on fasting and skin cancer. So what we eat and what we don't eat are just as important, you know, how we eat. And again, I wrote all about that in the book as well, because these are lessons I had to learn for myself. You know, um, we're just had so much dogma about like, eat this, don't eat this. And it's like, you have to tune into what your body needs. Your diet is going to be very different from mine, right? And especially stress and, and the havoc that it wrecks on our digestive system. You know, our body is thinking it needs to get out of whatever harm's way. Digestion is just not on the top priority list. It's going to shut down. So then we have, you know, indigestion and bloating and constipation and dysbiosis and all the things, which then can show up on your skin in a host of ways because we know that there's that gut skin connection. And so I always like to teach people that they can use their skin as their greatest asset. I think most people look in the mirror and they're like, oh, I'm breaking out or I have this rash or this wrinkle. And, you know, they just use it as license to beat themselves up especially women. I think that it's it's really easy in the beauty industry is all over them on that, right? It's a $500 billion plus industry. They've got the cream and the serum and the salve and the procedure to help with it. But here's the thing. I don't have anything against any of those products. They can be very useful. But when you see that your hair is thinning, if you see the lateral third of your eyebrows have fallen out, if you see that you have dark circles under your eyes or you are breaking out, Rather than beating yourself up to try and cover it up or like there's something wrong with you, it's like use that information as like to your advantage. That is your skin. That's your body's way of saying, hey, I need your support. I need your help right now. And you might not know exactly what that is. You might have to go see the professional or, you know, so, but it gives you the opportunity to pause and be like, what is happening in my world? What's been happening in the last couple of days, last couple of weeks? How am I feeling? Check back in and be like, oh yeah, there's like, 
something, you know, big deadline at work or, you know, got into it with my significant other. The kids are really, you know, homeschooling them is just, I'm at my wit's end. And then I've been comfort eating and eating foods that aren't serving me very well. And it's like this vicious cycle and I'm not sleeping because the only time I have to myself is like when the kids go to bed and now I'm on my device for like whatever. So it's just, it all adds up. Yeah. I love, I think you, you said that so eloquently and so perfectly You really outlined, I think what a lot of us have experienced and sometimes going to the doctor oftentimes is they're just masking things with add this medication. Okay. Try this. Okay. That's not working. Add this one. And if we just slow down for a second and deal with the stress, you know, try the breath work, eat a little bit better, like all these things, these can in many cases be even more impactful. So on that note, I thought it would be fun to do a little rapid fire since you do have this more holistic mind body viewpoint of health for some common issues. And when someone says, okay, I have this issue or I'm struggling with this, like, what are the things that you think about? Like, what are the things that your body might be telling you? Uh, so acne. Food, diet, for sure. Because for some people, dairy can be a big culprit and sugar. Those are the big ones because they turn on insulin growth factor one receptor, which directly stimulates your oil glands. So I'd be looking at gut health for acne and stress. So I wrote a contribute to a chapter in the integrated book of dermatology, stress and acne, and not only how stress can trigger acne in the inflammatory cascade, but also how it's impacting the individual. You know, 85% of the population will have been impacted by acne and studies have shown that it doesn't matter how mild the physician might think it is when it's on your skin, it could be catastrophic. So we really need to deal with how it's impacting how you feel in your skin. So those would be the two things like, you know, stress and diet for acne. Yes. Yes. Love that. Okay. How about dry dehydrated skin? Oh, again, are you sleep? Like, how are you sleeping? Because, you know, we always think of like hydration, but just drinking a ton of water isn't necessarily directly correlating to how hydrated your skin is. But again, sleep and stress. And the biggest reason is skin rejuvenates and repairs at night, hydration rebalance. If you're not sleeping, then, you know, your other hormones are, are out of whack and we may be stress eating because we're tired and then, you know, inflammation and so big cascade, yeah. but sleep and stress for dry dehydration. And, and, and what about uh, like omega-3s and essential fatty acids? Yeah. So, so again, so helpful, so important for so many reasons, omega-3 fatty acids, but especially for um, the anti-inflammatory response that it has throughout the body, but also very helpful for our skin. Okay. What about dark circles under the eyes? Okay. So again, sleep. <laughs> I'm noticing a pattern here. So yes, I'm uh, all day long. Beauty sleep is real. Beauty sleep is real. And liver health too. Like, w- what are you eating? Are there any food sensitivities? Because sometimes, you know, we think about uh, they would call it allergic shiners, food sensitivities, sleep. Those are those are big ones. And liver health. So how are, how is your body dealing with all of this? And how are you detoxifying? So yeah, gut, liver health, and yeah. Okay. What about cellulite, like excessive cellulite? That's a challenging one. So I think there's definitely some, there could be some genetic predispositions and things like that. People will talk about lymphatic drainage and dry brushing. And I'm like rubbing my thighs, like the paddles (laughs) and all the things. That's a challenging one. So I would say, yeah, I think just movement, circulation, but also looking at, you know, some, some, we all have cellulite. I mean, you look at babies, they've got cellulite. And, so, and the supermodels and the, you know. Everyone has it. So, yeah. yeah. And what about, so I know that you do now in your practice, you really focus on helping women uh, with hormonal health, particularly around menopause. So I know one side effect or issue of, of that is like overheating, right? And feeling like heat, flashes of heat and just always feeling hot. So what about for that? What, what are you looking yeah. at? you know, I've kind of stepped away from prescribing bioidentical hormones. I I think there's so many benefits from it, but what I found especially was the focus of the conversation was how are you sleeping and and your stress? So 
<laughs> Hot flashes, some of the biggest triggers. Yes, it's a, a decrease in estrogen and fluctuating hormone levels. But what are the things that cause your hormones to drop even further? Stress. <laughs> it's always stress. What can stress the body? So we know for hot flashes in particular, alcohol can worsen hot flashes, sugar intake. So blood sugar dysregulation can be a stress on the body as well and worsen hot flashes. So I really look at diet, alcohol included in that, sleep when we're not sleeping, that can create uh, challenges with your cortisol. So our circadian rhythm, the natural rhythm that our body follows, you know, cortisol is supposed to go down at night and back up in the morning, right? But when our sleep pattern is off, if we're staying up late, eating late on our devices, that cortisol curve can get flipped or can get really irregular. And so then we're kind of wired and tired. So really looking at sleep. I always, I keep coming back to <laughs> Well, it's, it, it sounds- affects everything. it affects your mood and yeah. like your ability to deal with any stress that comes your way. So that cortisol can wreak havoc on your skin. It breaks down the collagen. collagen. So, you know, for that youthful, if you want to, if, if the best anti-aging strategy is sleep Happiness. and comfort and right. But, and yeah. From within. And, and all of these things we're talking about, I full on acknowledge they are simple. They are not easy. This is why big pharma is such big industry because we all want the quick fix. We all want the magic pill to like, and sometimes we need it. I am not poo-pooing I am an allopathically trained physician, 100% fan of Western medicine, but there is a bridge that we need to create because the pill can only do so much. It's all the other lifestyles, how we, you know, truly nourish ourselves. All the, like, like, we have to do all the things, but you start with the one thing, you start with the one thing and then you build on that. So it doesn't feel so overwhelming because we don't want to make it stressful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, no, of course. <laughs> Exactly. And it sounds like, you know, just for example, starting with sleep, you know, you can, you can get so far just with starting with sleep and then, and then, okay, maybe just adding in some additional stress relieving techniques and uh, just these baby steps, I feel like add up to such incredible, powerful results over, over time. Yeah, for sure. So one, another thing that I, I like about your approach to health, to wellness, is that you're also, also a big proponent of helping women feel more comfortable in their skin, to really love their bodies. And I feel like we live in a time where that's not the overall messaging. The messaging is there's something wrong with you. You need to fix your face. You need to do something about it. You can't age. Don't age. Definitely don't age. You know, we, we open Instagram, social media, and there's just so much injections and filters and all of this. So with all of this pressure, how do you recommend people to start falling in love with themselves and not feeling this pressure to conform to these societal standards? Yeah, no, it is hard. And again, we teach best what we need to learn the most. I know full on what it's like not to feel comfortable in my skin. And I'd be lying if I said, that I always feel confident in my skin. I have plenty of days when I don't, but that's where self-compassion really comes into play. And I didn't even know what self-compassion was until recently. And I think it's really just giving yourself permission to be like, listen, there is nothing wrong with me. Everything that I'm seeing, if, if nothing else, start from a neutral place, right? I think it's impossible to go from like, I hate myself to I love myself. I think that's a, that's a huge leap. But when you look in the mirror, can you at least find something that you admire, that you have appreciation for? So you've got cellulite on your thighs, but are you able to stand up? Or even if you're not, if you're you know in a wheelchair, like what have those legs been able to serve you? Like what has been their function? Can we appreciate their function? Um, and come from just a place of gratitude and appreciation, I think is always the place to start there's always something that we can appreciate about ourselves, right? Like our eyelashes, you know, they may not be as lush and you might feel like you need falsies, but those eyelashes are protecting your eyes from debris. They serve a function. So to start from a place of appreciation and gratitude, gratitude. Is, where I, is where always where I start. 
I know for me, starting a gratitude practice was definitely life-changing because it puts you, if you do that every morning, so gratitude practice, I'm sure everyone has heard of it. It's basically, usually you do it in the morning when you wake up, you can do it in your head. You could journal it out if you want. You just write down or think about all the things that you're grateful for, for however long, you know, you could do it for a minute. You could do it for longer. Uh, you could do three things, five things. Uh, but simply starting your day by focusing on the positive, focusing on what you're grateful for, it sets you up for a day where you continue to do that versus always looking at what's going wrong, what we don't like, you know, the negative side of things. So it it's such an easy, subtle, quick thing and it's free, right? It's so simple. You know, sometimes we just, again, we want to take the pill or we want to do something, but just simply thinking about this for 30 or 60 seconds in the morning completely shifts your day. It really does. And same thing at night. So it's usually before, you know, as soon as I get up, And then before I fall asleep, just like three things, three things that you're grateful for, but especially when it comes to our persona, like our, our appearance and feeling comfortable and confident in our skin, having appreciation for the body parts is one place to start. So gratitude in the morning and the evening, I think, especially because as good intention as we have to keep that good feeling going, things will have come up throughout the day that will derail us. So if we can end our day on a high note, by having gratitude, we'll sleep better. We'll feel more relaxed to get a good night's sleep, which we know is so important for our skin in general. Oh, I know what I was going to say. So having appreciation, but again, when you see something in the mirror that you don't think should be there or is you know a blemish or what have you, just keep in mind that that's an opportunity, right? It's not something to be, you know, berated. It's it's an opportunity to understand what your body needs, what kind of tender love and care is it asking of you to give it? Because your skin, when you're living well, moving well, you know, loving well, all of those things, those nourishing activities that we do, your skin will glow. It won't, it won't be able to help itself. It's going to be your biggest cheerleader, your biggest advocate. But when you're not doing those things, it is the crappiest confidant. It will tell all the secrets. It'll gossip about you, but it's in many ways, that's not a bad thing either. It's like the best kind of gossip you could ever imagine because you could do something about it. So my, I guess my message is like, this is empowering, right? Society would like to disempower us. I am aging. I am not Benjamin Button. I am not aging in reverse. I think I hate the term anti-aging. Because I can't. So do I. It's impossible. <laughs> yes, can we? And you don't want to. Yeah, I you don't, don't even. Want to. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, for so many reasons, like we are so fortunate to live this life, and every day is a gift. It is not guaranteed. And so, if I can age, I'm. I want to celebrate that. So we can celebrate aging. We can embrace aging, but we can minimize the inflammaging so that we can age well age healthfully. So when you see this stuff on your face, it's not something that instantaneously you need to go out and buy, purchase something to cover it up. It's like, use that, be empowered, learn more about yourself. What do you need right now? What would feel like love right now for you? Yeah, I love that. And it's, I love that you said inflammaging because I do think that not just with skin, but in general, we have these preconceived notions of what it means to age. And in our Western society, aging means getting worse. It means a decline. It means getting wrinkles and getting heavier and having high blood pressure and this, that, and the other thing. But that's not necessarily, you know, that's a result of our our diet and lifestyle more than it is a result of aging. So it's important to make that, that distinction. I agree. We need to celebrate that we're getting older every year not hide the fact that we're getting older, but of course, you know, do whatever we want to do to look, look the way that we want to look and feel the way that we want to feel. Right. I think the cosmetic industry, the beauty industry are, you know, so lucrative for a reason. And I am not anti procedures or anything. It's a matter of the intentionality behind it. Why it's, it's your why, you know, if you feel so good, you feel great. You feel confident and you want the outside to mirror this inside, go for it. Your return on investment will be 
like beyond. The challenge is when we operate from the space of, okay, I need to do X, Y, and Z procedure, get filler, get Botox. So then I will feel more beautiful. I will feel more worthy. I will feel more confident. You will never get the outcome you're desiring and you'll keep searching for that next thing and you'll spend all this money and you'll, and, and, and so you're not going to get that return on investment. And so that's, I guess, the space that I would love to support women to help them know that they're already worthy. Like they don't need to do any of these things. And it may be hard to believe, but you can get there. It is going to be hard work, but it's so worth it. So that when you want to do those things, like you get your money's worth. Right. Yeah. I think that's a great distinction. And we do, you know, if we're trying to fix ourselves, it's going to be very hard. There's not going to be no end to it. There's always something to fix. There's always something next. But, you know, when we're happy with ourselves and we're doing it more from a place of love, then yeah, like little tweaks here and there, I think they will, you know, they, they could make you happier. It's more when you're doing it from a place of hate and fixing. I feel like that it just becomes a never ending yeah. cycle. There's no denying, like, you know, getting your uh, hair blow. I think that's dry bars tap on or something it's like we don't sell blowouts we sell confidence and in many ways it's true sometimes you know starting with the outside you know if you need a little zhuzhing to be the catalyst for you to take better care of yourself so be it do whatever you need to do to be able to take better care of yourself to show yourself some love right that's it, it has to start someplace yeah. Because when we don't, when we don't value ourselves and we don't come from a place of love, we wind up with like, I did <laughs> with like skin cancer and hormone issues, having multiple surgeries and just like kind of hitting rock bottom. And it's not a great place to be. And I get it. Some of us, we need to go there. Otherwise without the shit, the shift won't happen. Yeah. Uh, but hopefully it's it's not as deep a pile. If, if, if anything that we talk about today can help, you know, ease that transition a little bit. Yeah. So we talked a lot about internal things that we can do to get a glow and, and mm -hmm. look healthier, feel better. What about some of the topical things in a skincare routine? What are you looking for? What do you recommend for, for glowing skin? Yeah. So I like to keep it simple, partly because I am the least compliant person. So it's got to be simple. Otherwise, I'm not doing it. So a skincare routine can be really simple. So a gentle cleanser. So your morning routine could be like three steps, a gentle cleanser, an antioxidant serum, right? Because you've, I'm like looking out my window because even if you work indoors, so my office is in front of a window, I'm in front of a screen, UVA rays penetrate your window glass. So if you're indoors, and UVA rays don't vary throughout the year, whereas UVB rays do. So you're getting exposure every day, all day long, if you're, even if you're indoors. And that causes, creates oxidative stress and DNA damage. So an antioxidant, vitamin C, E, um, resveratrol, you know, there's, there's lots of, but at minimum, vitamin C and E are great antioxidants to have in, in your serum. And then SPF, Every single day, whether it's in your a tinted moisturizer would be great because then that can serve as like your foundation. And tinted, having iron oxides will also protect from blue light, the high energy visible light that we get from our devices, which we know can cause pigmentation and also has been shown to have an effect on collagen and elastin. So washing your face and antioxidant serum and SPF 30 plus every single day, be on your way. Evening, gentle uh, cleanser. You can use your antioxidant serum again, and then a topical product like a retinoid, if you can tolerate it for increasing skin cell turnover, uh, helping with repair. So Retin-A is, you know, it comes, it's prescription strength. It comes in different strengths, but your retinols, retinoids that you can get retinols, retinolides that you can get over the counter. And if you can't tolerate the topical retinoids because they can cause dryness, irritation, sensitivity. They do make you more sensitive to sun, which is why we only use them at night and that we wear sun protection in, in the daytime. But something like Bacuchiol is a nice alternative because the studies were done, retinol and Bacuchiol head to head, and they showed equal efficacy. If not, Bacuchiol actually was a little bit more efficacious and it didn't create the same skin irritation. 
And it's oh, safe, that's it's safe to use in pregnancy, whereas topical retinoids, when taken, well, when taken by mouth, vitamin A derivatives are a category X, so they're not safe. Use topically, we use so little, it's probably fine, but we always say don't do it. Whereas Bacuchiol, it's thought to be safe to use. Yeah, I always wonder about things that are like making your skin peel off. Uh, you know, like a sunburn, for example, is not good, but then sometimes we use skincare that's doing the same thing, right? Making our skin peel off. And I know there's a lot of talk now about the skin barrier and nourishing our skin barrier and our microbiome. So yeah, I, I don't know any thoughts on that. I, I just feel like that's such a big topic now or any insights there. Yeah. So we're still learning about the microbiome everywhere in the body, but you know, your skin is your barrier, your ultimate barrier between the inside and outside world. So maintaining that barrier is really important. So moisturizing the skin, you humectants draw moisture into the skin, occlusive agents seal that moisture in. So depending on the time of year, you may need a product that has humectant properties as well as occlusive. So occlusive properties could be like coconut oil, shea butter, um, petroleum, which I'm not a big fan of, but castor bean oil uh, has been as an alternative um, humectant is like drawing moisture to the skin, like glycerin, for instance. So, and the important thing too is the skin microbiome, depending on what we're using on our skin, different personal care products, soaps, cleansers, it can shift the microbiome. So, if you're noticing more skin irritation, inflammation, you know, it all, it's, it's a matter of awareness, looking at the products that you're using and maybe shifting them out to, no fragrance or, or other products that can support the skin. So we're learning more about that, even the sun. So there are certain bacterial strains on the skin that are thought to be sun protective. So, yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, cause, and it's still kind of around, but this popularity of like a 10 step skincare routine and, you know, opponents of it are saying, well, you're, you're basically breaking your skin barrier down and your protection, you know, and then you have to like, keep adding more products to, to protect it again, when you could just leave your skin alone and just use more gentle things. And, uh, you know, <laughs> then, then your skin also might not be sensitive. I think there's also so many people's skin are so sensitive now, and it's just because we're constantly putting all this stuff on it. Yeah. I think and matching. less is more. I think the 21 step skin care, I mean, more power to you if you can have like, do it. I, I'm just, again, I'm, I'm not the compliant. I'm, I'm a little lazy, the simpler, the better. And I don't think sometimes less is more. You really need to, you know, just gently cleanse the skin because we know that, especially at the end of the day, if you're only going to wash your face once, do it at night because we know that air pollution, you know, can settle on the skin. The, the polyaromatic hydrocarbons can settle on the skin and, and contribute to hyperpigmentation and oxidative stress. So you want to cleanse all that debris off and then, you know, help repair, rejuvenate and repair. So that's where the antioxidant, your, your skin has its natural antioxidant system, but it gets used because we're constantly exposed to stressors all day long. So kind of replenishing that with a topical formulation and then helping the skin rejuvenate and repair. So your skin cells turn over every, you know, approximately every 30 days or so. But as we get older, that cycle slows down. So you might have that dull, sallow appearance. So using a product like a topical retinoid to help improve the skin cell turnover so the young, healthy cells can come to the surface is important. So you don't need a lot. Yeah. And you know, sometimes if I'm not wearing makeup, I feel like, Oh, I don't really need to wash my face at night, but you know, being in New York and, and having the window open, sometimes I'll, I'll wipe down the, the, and then it'll look white. Like the windowsill will look white, but I'll wipe it down and the, the paper towel is black. So yeah, definitely don't, don't skimp on washing your face at night. Yeah. Now I know you really focus on supporting women with their hormonal health, particularly during menopause. So any tips for anyone experiencing that, or, you know, there are hormonal skin issues. So how, how does someone know if, if their skin issue might be hormonal and, and what should they do? Yeah. So that's a challenging one because hormonal issues can happen and hormonal issues can happen at any time, starting in our teens or twenties, but especially 
for women wondering if they're heading into the menopausal phase of life. So menopause, it can really be broken down into three phases, like pre or perimenopausal. So the time frame leading up to menopause. Menopause is actually a day. It's a milestone. It's 12 months after your last menstrual period. You are now officially a menopausal woman and everything after that is post-menopause. So we, women spend about a third of their lives in a hormone deficient state. And that can start for many women in their mid to late thirties. And it starts with the hormone progesterone is the first hormone that really starts to diminish first. And so what women may notice from a symptom standpoint is progesterone is thought to be the great relaxer, the great calming hormone. So they might notice they're feeling more anxious all of a sudden they're feeling more anxious than they have before. What's going on? They're not sleeping as well. And then when it comes to our skin and our hair, progesterone plays an important role in regulating some hair issues. So testosterone is that androgen, that that male hormone. And testosterone is converted into a more potent form called dihydrotestosterone. And that conversion happens through an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. Well, progesterone normally is responsible for blocking that hormone. So kind of modulating that conversion of testosterone to its more potent form. Why that's important, especially in our mid to late thirties, forties, and on up. On the scalp, this more potent form of testosterone, dihydrotestosterone, affects the hair follicles by what we call follicular miniaturization. It causes the hair follicles to shrink. So the caliber for the hair coming out is much thinner, much finer. And so how that looks clinically is male pattern hair loss or female pattern hair loss. Women may notice that their their part has become wider, their skin, their hair looks more thin and fine. They almost look like they're going bald. On the face, it has the exact opposite effect. Dihydrotestosterone can stimulate those hair follicles. So women may notice, oh my God, I'm going bald, I'm growing a beard, WTF. Okay. So now this can happen also with a, in like PCOS and other situations that aren't necessarily menopausal. It's it's hormonal imbalances. But if you're in your mid to late thirties and you're noticing a shift, so it's it's a clue. We know that estrogen also plays a significant role in our skin and hair health. So again, women may notice that the biggest causes of hair loss in menopausal women is chronic telogen effluvium, and I'll share what that is in a second female pattern hair loss, and trauma to the hair through chemical or physical press. So if you straighten your hair, you chemically treat your hair. Chronic telogen effluvium brings us back to stress. So your hair grows in three phases, a growing phase, a resting phase, a falling out phase, a falling out phase, telogen. So chronic telogen effluvium means the hair is just in chronically like shifted into that falling out phase. And so We are in a pandemic, life stresses, things like that, that can contribute. And also stress on the body as hormones are shifting. Estrogen plays a significant role in hair growth because it prolongs that growth phase. So as, and this is why when we're pregnant and estrogen levels are increasing, our hair becomes more lush and full. When we give birth, hormone levels plummet. And a lot of women will notice their hair is shedding. That's why just precipitous drop in in your estrogen levels. Same thing starts to happen in menopause. So as levels are starting to go down, progesterone is going down first. So there's a relative estrogen dominance, but estrogen levels are still declining. So the hairs being in that growing phase, that's diminishing. So women may notice that their hair is either shedding a little bit more, or it's just not as full or it's thick. Estrogen also plays a significant role in skin hydration. So it's responsible for creating hyaluronic acid. What women are paying to have injected into their face, estrogen is creating naturally. So women may notice that their skin is more dry, more sallow, and not just on their face, but on their body and especially their vaginal area. So that's where sex can become a little bit more uncomfortable. All of a sudden, they weren't needing lube before, now they need lube. Same thing, estrogen plays a significant role in collagen formation. So noticing more fine lines and wrinkles as they're getting older, as the hormone levels are dropping. So I know that's a lot, but like our sex hormones play a significant role in our skin and hair health, which is why people are like, 
why would a dermatologist get into menopause? It's because it's the first, like all these signs that you start to see actually are due to hormonal changes. Again, you can use your skin as this amazing reflection of what's happening in your body. So if someone in their thirties or or even in menopause comes to you with these symptoms, so what are you recommending? Like eating more phytoestrogen rich foods, obviously reducing the stress. We know that's a big one and sleeping more. Uh, But how would you recommend people get their estrogen up? Yeah. So it really, I will preface it by saying every woman is different. And it really depends on what her own personal thoughts about hormone replacement therapy are, what her personal history is, what her medical history is, if it's even appropriate for her. So even though I had been prescribing, I've kind of stepped away from that and just would refer to my colleagues. But again, it really starts with lifestyle because hot flashes, which is one of the big symptoms and one of the most bothersome symptoms associated with menopause isn't just because estrogen is decreasing, right? It's blood sugar regulation and it's stress and it's other factors. So I always take a step back and look at lifestyle factors and really build a strong foundation of inner resilience. I collaborate with a functional nutritionist and work closely with her to help see where we can fill in gaps for, for these women, because it really is about building a strong foundation. Yes, some women may want hormones. Some women may need hormones in the long term. But if you just put hormones into the mix and they're not, their, their gut health is off or their uh, liver and their detoxification, how they metabolize the estrogens is not optimally functioning. They're not going to feel well if you just give them the hormones. So we really have to take a step back, a more global approach and look at nutrition and look at sleep and stress is a big one. So that's always where I start. I love it. Well, this has been so insightful and informative. Thank you so much. So before we go, there's one question I like to ask all my guests. If you can leave our listeners with just one tip or piece of advice to live a happier and healthier life, what would that be? That's such a hard one. There's like so much I want to say, but I think it touches on when looking in the mirror, right? Finding that one thing that you can appreciate and asking yourself the question, like what would feel like love right now? Like, so we can get to the place of loving ourselves, which may take some time, but that's where I would start. I love that. Well, thank you so much. Where can people find you? Yeah. So my website, drkirabar.com. And I'm starting to get a little bit more social on Instagram at drkirabar. So those are the best places. Yeah, so go say hi to Kira, Dr. Kira Barr on Instagram and her website. I will link to those in the show notes. Thank you.